So um, as you can see, it's been an absolute whirlwind with hormonal therapy. And a lot of my work is to try to understand what the side effects and complications are of different approaches to hormonal therapy or systemic therapy actually in general, so we can make smart decisions with our patients and engage them in decision making and then support them because most people don't take a treatment without having any side effects at all. Um, these are the same relevant disclosures that we just discussed. Uh, I am not going to say I'll say them again or I'll get in trouble. AstraZeneca, Bayer, Janssen, Genentech, Sanofi, Seattle Genetics, and Astellas. Um, sorry, that's for CME. You are now trained on my disclosures. Uh, so the learning dis objectives for this, um, this talk are to really recognize the medical um, complications experienced by prostate cancer survivors who are receiving hormonal therapies. Um, and this includes skeletal, cardiac, metabolic, psychological, and cognitive effects. Uh, and that list has really continued to grow. The data supporting all that has continued to grow, and we'll review some of that. We'll think about populations who are at highest risk for developing these complications so that, again, we can target those populations with supportive care um, and with screening, should we need it to prevent complications that are even more intense, and to examine approaches to reduce or prevent complications from causing morbidity and actually increase mortality in men receiving hormonal therapy. The professional practice gap is that actual practice includes a lack of knowledge about the side effects of ADT and methods to identify, prevent, and treat these complications. And ideal practice behavior is to have a command of knowledge over all of these side effects that we discussed in the last slide and to utilize standardized approaches to identify them, prevent them, and treat the complications. Um, and this is just the outline, so we'll move along. We just talked about how common prostate cancer is. We've talked about that all day, I think. Um, but again, a number of patients, 40% of patients, even those treated with localized disease, will ultimately have relapse of their disease and potentially get treatment with ADT. Um, and actually, some literature suggests that up to half of men will undergo treatment with ADT at some point during their, um, their care for prostate cancer. And ADT, I think, is really, um, as we all know, complex, but just to review, this is really treatment, if we're using GnRH agonists or antagonists, that acts on the pituitary to decrease LH secretion um, and then decrease testosterone secretion. But importantly, we're also decreasing estradiol production because of the peripheral aromatization of testosterone to estradiol in men. So the side effects of ADT are not just related to low testosterone, but also, in some cases, driven by low levels of estradiol as well. And actually, levels can be lower than uh, levels of women who are going through menopause. So very, very low levels of this critically important hormone. The other thing that I think is really important to recognize when we're thinking about side effects in this population is that ADT, or uh, the prostate cancer specifically, affects disproportionately older men. Um, and we know that the median age of diagnosis is 66, um, which is an older population. And as men get older, they have an increasing number of comorbid illnesses and other things that can increase their complication rate from other medical issues, as well as their complications from ADT, as we'll review. Um, and interestingly, as men get older, they're increasingly exposed to ADT. So it's sort of this synergy uh, of two, or confluence of two um, not great features. So if we look at the overall population in this recently reported cohort study, um, we see that about 45% of men in the first year of their diagnosis with prostate cancer receive some ADT. Um, and if we look at those patients who are older, over 80, 60% of them receive some treatment with ADT. And so my hope is that some of these practice patterns may be changing, especially as we discuss um, and, and as a community that primary ADT is not necessarily going to help our patients live longer or feel better, but these are the patterns as they were at least a few years ago. So the bottom line is that treatment with hormonal therapy is common and the most common cancer in American men. And understanding the, the complications of hormonal therapy is really critical as we think about improving the outcomes for these patients, not just in terms of their prostate cancer, but in their other health, um, and really supporting them as older individuals in many cases to prevent complications. So I think most of us in the room probably already know the medical complications of ADT. Certainly we know the complications related to libido, erectile function, and hot flashes. But just to review, increased risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, psychological effects and cognitive change, sarcopenia or loss of muscle mass, weight gain, decline in bone mineral density, and increased fracture risk. And on the bottom, I have a, a slide that I've uh, taken from a colleague's paper a few years ago that I really think illustrates the uh, increase in 
anterior abdominal adipose tissue, which we see in many of our men. If we look at the slide on the left, this is a gentleman who's not started ADT yet, and on the right, this is a gentleman who's been on ADT for several years. And you could see quite a big difference in the robustness of the anterior abdominal muscles, and then that dark um, area there is that increased ad adipose tissue around the outside of that individual. That This is a pretty common scenario that we see with prolonged exposure to ADT. In the U.S., we also know that cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death in men. And cardiovascular disease actually has been linked in some studies and not in other studies with ADT. One of the early studies of this was a population-based study looking at veterans where uh, Nancy Keating and Matthew Smith actually identified that patients exposed to ADT or who had orchiectomy actually had an increased risk of cardiovascular disease within that cohort. But further study, including a Henry Sy's study and then a nice meta-analysis by Paul Nguyen, looked at randomized trials and did meta-analyses and actually did not see the same signal for the development of cardiovascular incidents with, um, with the exposure to ADT, whether that was different populations, a veteran's population which already has other comorbidities versus a clinical trial population that's generally healthier and younger, um, we don't know, but the controversy remains. Some Canadian studies actually failed to show an increase in cardiovascular disease, so still a lot of controversy there, although in general, I think, and, and based on some, some warnings that were put out by the FDA, that there is an association between ADT exposure and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. We know certainly at a biologic level that ADT affects cardiac risk factors. It increases total cholesterol, it increases triglycerides, it actually increases HDL, a good cholesterol, but it does cause that change as well. Increased abdominal adipose tissue and impaired glucose metabolism, as we'll mention in a minute. So it sets up the perfect storm to develop cardiac disease. And importantly, too, there may be some patients who are more vulnerable, and this may lead to our misunderstanding of whether ADT is associated with cardiovascular disease if we have a, a population that's not including these vulnerable patients to drive the events. So when another study was done looking specifically at patients who had cardiovascular risk factors, there was an association between the development of cardiovascular disease additional events in those patients who were exposed to long-term ADT who had cardiovascular history. Um, our group also at Vanderbilt um, put together a study looking at a long-term outcome study called the Prostate Cancer Outcome Study. It was a prospective cohort, and we looked at men who were exposed to short-term ADT less than two years um, versus men who were exposed to long-term ADT of two years or more, and we looked at the synergy between increasing age and exposure to ADT to determine whether it was maybe a synergistic relationship or an older population being more vulnerable to developing these cardiovascular complications. What we found was that in the short-term ADT, there was really no association between ADT exposure and cardiovascular events. But in the long-term ADT exposed population of greater than or equal to two years, we found that with increasing age, there was an increased risk of cardiovascular events with sort of an inflection point around the age of 74. So again, trying to identify a, a potentially vulnerable population, whether that's an older population or a population who has a history of cardiovascular disease, I think is important as we treat our patients. So the NCCN um, and other guidelines organizations have put together cardiovascular care guidelines for men who are receiving ADT. Um, they really suggested that using um, an approach, and the ABCD approach was, um, uh, was suggested, but an approach that's a systematic method of monitoring cardiovascular disease and partnering with, with colleagues, whether they're cardiologists or cardio-oncologists or primary care to really make sure that we identify risk factors that, on which we can intervene in terms of cardiovascular health and re reduce them. The ABCDE approach is really just a way for us to remember an acronym that helps us think about what cardiovascular risk factors might be, um, might be possible to affect with our patients. So awareness of this issue, aspirin for those patients in whom it's appropriate, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, cessation of cigarette smoking, diet and diabetes control, and um, encouraging exercise. The other piece of that, when I think of cardiovascular disease, I always think about diabetes because they are so closely linked in terms of um, the events that they can cause. And ADT does seem to be linked to diabetes actually more clearly than it is linked to cardiovascular disease. Again, Nancy Keating and Matthew Smith's group, um, a different study this time, but this was a SEER Medicare analysis that looked at those patients who developed uh, incident diabetes in the setting of ADT and found, again, that an, a prolonged exposure to ADT was associated um, with the development of diabetes in this population. <clears throat> 
Our group looked at diabetes when we looked at um, cardiovascular disease found with short-term ADT in this prospective cohort study. There was no increased risk of diabetes, but in long-term ADT, um, there was with, with increasing age. So we found an inflection point around the age of 76 where there was a significantly increased risk of developing diabetes with exposure to long-term ADT. You can see the odds ratio there. So again, thinking about vulnerable populations and ways that we can screen and monitor. Um, I always partner actually with primary care or some patients who already have diabetes. I partner with their endocrinologists if they have them to continue to monitor hemoglobin A1Cs. Um, there is not actually specific and strict guidance from any uh, organization that I'm aware of that says you must measure hemoglobin A1C once a year or every six months or whatever it is. Um, so I try to follow this general approach. Again, this is included in the ABCDE uh, approach of, um, of partnering and asking the primary care docs to continue to monitor and screen for diabetes in patients at least once or twice a year while they're on ADT. We also know that ADT is associated with the development of osteoporosis because it does have effects that cause uh, decrease in the bone mineral density through multiple mechanisms. So it increases the skeletal response to PTH and importantly getting back to the issue of having both low testosterone and low estrogen levels, it causes uh, this imbalance. With low estrogen levels, we actually see an increase in osteoclast activity and a decrease in osteoblast activity. So it shifts the balance, the, the constantly ongoing balance that we have in our bones of bone buildup and breakdown, really in the direction of bone breakdown and thinning of the bones. Importantly, one in five men over 50 will develop osteoporosis regardless of their exposure to ADT. So this is a real phenomenon in men and not just one in women. Um, and the incidence of osteoporosis increases with age, getting back again to the issue of ADT being more common in elderly men and this sort of being um, sort of a perfect storm of risk factors for that person. ADT is associated with an increased risk of fracture, not just with thinning of the bones. As we can see here, this was a landmark paper back in 2005 that demonstrated that increased exposure to prolonged ADT, so uh, doses of greater than, greater than or equal to nine doses or orchiectomy with you know, complete um, removal of testosterone from the system, was really associated in a dose-dependent uh, uh, manner with the development of fracture. So again, uh, fragility fracture related to ADT is not just an issue for women. Um, 20 to 25 percent of hip fractures actually occur in men worldwide. And importantly, the mortality associated with the hip fracture in men is two times higher in the first six months after the fracture than it is in women. So really and truly a complication that we need to prevent. And mortality actually persists past the first year after the fracture and exceeds that of women at all time points. Um, and we all know, of course, that hip fracture can cause a loss of mobility, a loss of independence in our patients, and uh, certainly a financial burden, so something we need to prevent. So guidelines have been developed to try to prevent this and to help us think it through, through both the NCCN and the National Osteoporosis Foundation, recommending supplemental calcium and vitamin D for most men on ADT, unless there's a contraindication, and additional pharmacologic osteoclast inhibitor therapy for men who have a 10-year probability of hip fracture of greater than or equal to 3%, or a 10-year probability of a major osteoporosis-related fracture of greater than or equal to 20%, and certainly to consider a baseline bone density test or a DEXA scan for men who are starting on ADT. I have a lot of trouble remembering how, I mean, I wouldn't know how to cal calculate a hip fracture risk or a major osteoporosis-related fracture risk, so I actually set, put everything into this FRAX calculator that I'm sure many of you have seen online. It was developed by a team in Sheffield, um, and I think it's fascinating that they've actually thought about the fracture risk for men and women around the world. So you can choose United States, you choose the race of your patient, and you plug all of this stuff in, so height and weight, um, previous fracture history, whether they're a smoker, whether they're on steroids, if they have a risk factor for secondary osteoporosis, which would be a yes because they're on ADT, um, how much they drink, and you can actually get from this calculator the risk of those two uh, factors. Um, they'll tell you the major osteoporosis fa um, risk or the risk of a hip fracture, um, and they'll actually write in there, you know, if you exceed the threshold so that you know, yes, I should be thinking about an osteoclast inhibitor agent in this patient. Um, you actually do not need a DEXA scans result to do this uh, calculator, which I also find helpful because there are some people who either refuse or just don't have the time, so you can actually do this with, with just the limit 
limited clinical information that you may already have in the chart. And as men get older, many, many, many of the men will actually meet criteria. Uh, a colleague and friend put together a paper that showed that nearly 95% of people over 85, regardless of all their other risk factors, would meet criteria to have additional pharmacologic therapy for prevention of fragility fractures related to ADT. So really important to think about and not so hard to do. Um, I also think a lot about depression in these patients on ADT. So we know depression is actually a huge issue in the United States and is really tightly linked with having comorbid illnesses. So if you have cancer, at least in one study, 42% of people with cancer also had depression. So something for us to think about, particularly because ADT is associated with an increased risk of depression. Um, this was a nice study done by the folks at Dana-Farber that found a 23% increased risk of depression associated with ADT exposure. Cognitive change is also something I think that we've heard a lot about in the media, at least my patients talk about it. There have been multiple papers that have come out that showed this really interesting association between um, exposure to ADT and having some difficulty thinking. A group at Moffitt with Brian Gonzalez and um, Paul Jacobson and Heather Jim put together a prospective study looking at exposure to ADT and development of cognitive change. And we'll go through that data in a minute, but they found that by 12 months there was a clear association with cognitive impairment with exposure. There were some population-based studies as well by the NEED group uh, at Penn. Um, it's two different studies showing both an association between ADT exposure and development of Alzheimer's and general dementias. Um, challenges with this is that they were not prospectively identifying and measuring dementia. So in a claims-based study, they may be underestimating the change in cognitive function because this is really just codes that physicians put into the chart to bill. And when I'm billing for somebody with dementia, I'm usually not billing some dementia code. So there may be many missed codes that could be underestimating the risk of dementia um, or potentially overestimating it. When you're not measuring it directly, it's not clearly what it is unless um, you have to go back and measure it, which is impossible in a claims-based study. A group from Canada did not find any association between ADT exposure and the development of cognitive change um, in two different studies. So really, again, this controversy between whether there's maybe an association or not, and it always makes me think about whether there might be a vulnerable population who might be overselected for in one study and underselected for in another study that could be driving differences in results. This is the, the Gonzalez paper where they prospectively assessed men who had prostate cancer and were, and were exposed to ADT versus had prostate cancer and were not exposed to ADT and found that the control population in the yellow bars had a decrease in cognitive impairment by 12 months. They were learning how to take the test, and so they were decreasing their cognitive impairment. They just knew how to take the test. But the guys on ADT actually got worse over time. So an increase in cognitive impairment, they didn't remember how to take the test. At least this was statistically significant by 12 months. So what do we do for men who are maybe experiencing cognitive function, maybe experiencing dementia? There's actually not specific guidance in the guidelines that I've come across at this point on this. Um, there are general medical guidelines suggesting that we should be screening people who are at high risk for depression by at least asking the question, are you, having, are you depressed? How is your mood? Um, because we do have effective treatments for depression, as everybody knows, and we should consider those, whether they're pharmacologic or counseling. Um, there are not any interventions, though, for cognitive change at this point. Um, and for many of our patients, unless we have the option to take them off of ADT, there's not a lot we can do. We can do some, um, there's cognitive rehab that people do after a stroke or after an ICU stay that could be useful, and we can always refer to a neurologist for that if we, if we want to. Um, but there are studies that are being uh, developed to address um, both the documentation of ADT-associated cognitive impairment as well as interventions, so we'll see where that goes. And the final thing I wanted to mention is that ADT can induce frailty, again, an issue in these older patients. So the complications of ADT that we've mentioned repeatedly have been loss of muscle mass, fatigue, osteoporosis, increased risk of falls, and, and inactivity generally. And the diagnosis of frailty is often made by meeting the following criteria, loss of lean weight, fatigue, exhaustion, osteoporosis, increased risk of falls, and decreased, decreased activity. So they really quite quite closely mirror each other. And we know that frail old, older adults in the geriatric literature actually have an increased risk of mortality. So we're pushing our patients in that direction. I think it's uh, incumbent upon us to identify these things as they develop and try to pull our patients back to, to normal levels in, in any sense that we can. Um, recognizing that these happen with our treatments, we have to do what we can to try to avoid them or try to uh, mitigate them. <laughs> 
So in summary, survivors living with or after hormonal therapies are at risk for cardiac, metabolic, skeletal, mood and cognitive complications and other effects that we all know about. Um, and that's actually similar in many ways to the frailty phenotype, which is associated with an increase in risk of mortality in the gener ge geriatric literature. So something that we need to think about and try to prevent. And cur current strategies, I think, are best enacted by multidisciplinary teams where we work together with our colleagues to try to prevent and identify these problems um, and really focusing on populations at greatest risk or who are most vulnerable so we can intervene where we need to um, and help people where they, where they need to be helped. So thank you.